So the title of today's session is a question that has probably crossed at least the minds of 50% of the people in this room. Does money corrupt? And for the 50% who might not have reflected on this question, I think you'll still find the talk interesting. Okay. Um, I'm here to introduce our speakers and one part of the introduction should make it interesting. So what I learned when I was working with these two is the diversity in their work habits. So uh, right now, Deborah will have been on work for probably about three hours as she gets up very early. And normally, uh, David would have been asleep for about two hours, okay? So what I would like to do is thank Deborah for interrupting her work schedule for coming. And I would like to thank David for, uh, you know, not going to bed just yet and uh, interrupting his sleep to present today. All right, so uh, David is uh, our, our academic for the day and he ha has a joint appointment between philosophy and Haskane. He is a research fellow in the Haskane uh, Canadian Centre for Advanced Leadership in Business and he manages the Integrity Network in Calgary. He has a PhD in business, but uh, his feet are still on the ground, so he'll do a great job today. Deborah um, has a joint English economics undergrad from the University of Alberta and an MBA from Queens. Uh, Deborah's first passion was sports journalism, but she uh, reluctantly became, and some might say, the leading Canadian business journalist in Canada. She writes for the financial. Post, Globe and Mail, Calgary Herald, and she's on regularly with the CBC. So what I'd like to do now is have David start with his uh, press, uh, discussion on this. All right. Hello. Thank you all so much for coming and for getting up at what for me is an unthinkable hour. <laughs> Philosophers die if you make them get up this early. So Descartes had this famous job where he got a gig with Queen, Queen Christina of Sweden. She wanted to take philosophy lessons at 4 o'clock in the morning. He took the job, he taught her for three months, and then he died. So, <laughs> I'm, deli so I'm risking my life to be here with you today. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. And I want to talk about money. So I bet that for everyone in this room, there's something that you wouldn't do no matter how much I paid you. Now. Let's be clear about this, because we might discover, if I could get the research funding for it, and I had a giant pile of money, that there are some things you would do if the price was right. Say I offered you $1,000, and you said, no, Dave, I'm not doing that. And then say, okay, $10,000, and you say, no, still not doing that, right? And they get to a million, nope, not doing it. And then I say, okay, $1.5 billion, and you say, okay, I'll do it, that's fine, right? Then we've discovered that you have a price for some things. Um, and you might be surprised to discover what your price is for some things if I had a pile of cash there to offer you. But as we continue this exercise, I suspect that we might get to something, probably something terrifying and disgusting, that I would suggest to you and go, nope, still not at a million, nope, still not at a billion, and then I keep going and giving you higher and higher numbers and the pile gets bigger and bigger, and then you're gonna be the richest person in the world if only you did this one horrifying, disgusting thing. And you say, you know, you can just stop, Dave, because no matter how much money you give me, I'm not gonna do that. It just wouldn't be worth it. That's the kind of thing that would change who I am. It would ruin my life. There's no amount of money you could offer me that would make that worthwhile. Um, and when we find that thing for you, whatever it is, then we found something that for you is beyond price. Uh, it's something that you wouldn't do no matter how much money I offered you. Um, so I'm not going to give you examples of these sorts of things because you're eating and they are typically disgusting and horrifying. Uh, but you might discover, you know, think about it for a minute, reflect for a moment on what sorts of things you wouldn't do, who you wouldn't betray, what you wouldn't be willing to undergo for any amount of money in the world. And when you find that thing, um, then you've discovered something interesting about money. You've discovered that it has a limit. Its power is great. In fact, maybe we'll discover that for a billion dollars you'd do something you thought you never would. My colleague Justin would do almost anything for 200 bucks. <laughs> so, <laughs> we might discover that there are some places where you do have a price. 
But there's a limit to what money can do. There's an upper bound at what the power of money has for you. And that's a nice way of framing what I want to talk about today. Because money is a tool. It's a tool we've invented, and it's really, really good at some things. But it doesn't apply everywhere, and its powers are great and vast, but they're not unlimited. Um, so before I dig into the research, let me just say one other thing by way of clarification. Uh, you might be thinking to yourself like, okay, Dave's a philosophy professor, he's also got this job in the business school, that's great, but like, Dave is a philosopher, he doesn't like money, and this is gonna be a screed about the bitterness about money, because Dave doesn't have any. If he knew how to make money, we'd be getting a very different talk from him right now, right? Um, and I wanna clarify that because I don't hate money. It's the center of my research. Uh, I'm currently teaching a class at the university called The Philosophy of Money, and I think it is one of the most fascinating subjects that we could talk about. That's why I'm joint appointed in a philosophy department and a business school, because I like to talk about money and what it shows us about value and ethics and all the rest of those things. So I don't want to come off as against money. There's a long tradition of philosophers who are very big fans of money. Adam Smith himself was chair in moral philosophy at the University of Glasgow. Aristotle, very big fan of money. So I don't want you to get the impression that I'm beating up on money. I just want to think critically about it and show you the powers that it has and the powers that it doesn't have. So to that end, I want to show you one and only one slide. Um, it'll be coming up in just one second. Let me tell you about it before it comes up. Don't worry. Uh, so there's some wonderful research by two economists, uh, Deaton and Kahneman, one of whom has a Nobel Prize. And they did this wonderful study. You probably heard a little bit about it in the media. It was called the $75,000 study. So they had a sample size of 400,000 people in America, and they gathered all of this data, and they asked them all sorts of questions about their well-being and then correlated it with all sorts of other things. Uh, one thing they found that being lonely is one of the worst things for your health as a result of this research. But they had this wonderful paper that correlated well-being and life evaluation with income. And what they found was this. So here, you can see that this is the curves that they came up with. So you'll notice that three of those curves there, the stress-free, the positive affect, and the not blue, those all go gently upward until about $75,000 annual income, and then they all kind of go flat. So let me tell you how they got to that result. Uh, what they would do is call people up who'd agreed to be in the survey and ask them the day before, just tell, tell me what happened to you the day before. Did you cry yesterday? Did you laugh yesterday? Did you smile yesterday? And as the answers to those questions were more positive, you got a more positive score. If you cried, you got a sort of lower score. And they found that there was this really robust um, connection between increasing household income and increasing positive answers to those kinds of questions, but not above about $75,000 a year. Your well-being got better up to a point, but then after that point, it just went flat. Um, and I can attest to this. I have personal experience because I have lived down at the bottom of that curve because I made the mistake of going to philosophy graduate school. So while I was in philosophy graduate school, living down there at the bottom of the curve, I got myself a speeding ticket. That speeding ticket wiped out my grocery budget for the month. And as a result, there was a lot less smiling, there was a lot more crying, and there was more loneliness, because my friends would call me up and say, hey, do you want to go out? And I'd say, I can't, speeding ticket, <laughs> right? But then, miracle of miracles, I got a job. I'm a philosopher with a job, right? So now, I live higher up on the curve. And as a result of that, a couple years ago, I got a speeding ticket, right? And I got a Calgary speeding ticket, so I didn't even know I'd gotten it. I got a letter in the mail discovering that I had a speeding ticket. And then I went, oh, I'm gonna pay, all right. And I paid it, and I didn't notice it anymore. I was shielded from a kind of suffering because I had some money. Um, but it turns out that the research indicates, and I'll never know because I'll never be up on the high end over there because I'm a philosopher, uh, but the research indicates that that experience isn't going to get any better for me. That once I'm able to pay a speeding ticket or buy my dinner or pay my rent and be fine, 
Fixing those problems won't make me any better in terms of how I report my smiling, my laughing, and my loneliness. So money has this power to buy something, right? It can actually buy me out of some suffering and make me smile more and cry less. But up to a certain, after a certain point, I'm not going to do any better, right? There's just a certain amount of smiling you get, and there's an upper bound, there are gonna be some tears, no matter how much money you have in terms of that well-being. So money is fantastically powerful at buying an amount of well-being, but it's bounded. There's a limit after which you don't see any kind of gains, right? And this is across 400,000 people, none of whom were reporting any consistently higher well-being even as their income went up. Um, now, you'll notice there's a darker line there. There's a fourth line that you might be going, wait, there's something that's going up there, right? The, the really robust positive relationship are answers to the ladder question. So the ladder question is, imagine your life is a ladder where the bottom rung is zero, and that's as bad as your life can possibly be, and the top rung is 10, and that's as good as your life can possibly be. Where are you on that ladder today? Well, it turns out that answers to that question go up in almost a linear fashion, right? A really nice relationship between those as income increases uh, and those questions will actually go up. Um, so now you gotta ask yourself, well, what really counts as happiness, right? If I report that I'm a seven, but I'm still crying as much as I was when I was a six, has my life gotten any better? I don't know, that's, philosophy. that's a philosophical question. Come take my class and we'll talk about that. Um, but what's most important for me is that there is a real palpable power to money. It does look like it can purchase you some well-being, but at a certain point it stalls out. There is a limit to what money can do, and that's the crucial thing to remember um, for the balance of my remarks. So I'm just gonna let that sit there, but I'm not gonna talk about it directly anymore because noticing that there is a limit to the power of money is what I think helps us understand how we manage to corrupt ourselves. So we can corrupt ourselves by forgetting that money has uh, a limited kind of power, and we can deceive ourselves into believing uh, that we can forget values of our own that we ourselves hold. Let me give you an example. There's a very famous study by Richard Titmus called the gift relationship, which looks at blood donation. So Titmus was working in the United Kingdom and he was looking at increasing the amount of blood supply for transfusions and surgeries and things like that. Um, at the time, the United Kingdom had a purely voluntary system. The only way you got blood was through voluntary donation and people were considering offering a financial incentive to increase the amount of blood supply available. The thinking was very obvious. Well, we already have X amount of blood from people who are just willing to give it away. Imagine how much more we will have if we start offering people money in exchange for their blood, right? That's gonna motivate the people who are already motivated even more, and it will pull all these people out of the woodwork who haven't been donating yet. So the idea was, well, if we add a financial incentive, we're gonna get an increase in the blood supply, which is great. This is what sort of economics would predict. This is fantastic. But Titmus argued very compellingly that if we offered a financial incentive like that, our blood supply would go down and it would be worse. Because when you offer a financial incentive for this, you change the nature of the transaction. So when I'm thinking about whether I ought to donate blood or not, I'm thinking to myself, okay, if I'm thinking about it as in terms of the gift relationship, I'm thinking, okay, if I go spend an hour and a half, two hours, and I get a little woozy, but I get juice and a cookie, right? What do I get out of that? <laughs> well, I get somebody who doesn't die during surgery, or I get to help a hemophiliac who needs a blood transfusion, or whatever, right? I got to help somebody. And isn't that worth 90 minutes of you know, gentle wooziness and a little pinprick? Of course, I'm perfectly willing to do that. That's, what, that's how people understand it when they're thinking about it as a gift. They're thinking about it in social, non-financial terms. But when you offer someone a financial incentive to do that and instead say, hey, we'll give you $25 if you come and donate blood, right? When you conceive of it as a financial transaction, you might think, okay, so I'm gonna spend about two hours doing this, $25, 1250 an hour. Mm, my time is worth more than that. I'm sorry, I can't do this. You, that's, I make way more money than 1250 an hour. There's no way that this is an efficient and sensible use of my time. And it turns out 
the very same people who think of the transaction as a gift are motivated to give blood, and they're more motivated, and more people are motivated to do it when they think of it as a gift. In, unlike the people, the same people, when they conceive of it as a financial transaction, uh, they're not nearly as motivated, right? So even when I think about coming here to talk to you today, right, um, I now make enough money that the offer of a free breakfast is not that moving. When I was in graduate school, I would do anything for a free breakfast, right? Because that was a wonderful use of my time, right? But now, happily, my hourly wage is high enough that if I thought of this as a financial transaction solely, it wouldn't make sense, right? But that's not what I'm here, and that's, that's not what I'm here trying to do. And all of that has to do entirely with how I'm framing the discussion. So that's the crucial thing, I think, that we have to remember here. Sometimes the difference between people who think in financial terms and people who think altruistically, this is conceived of as different people in opposition to one another. What it really is, is all of us conceiving of things just with different frames of reference. So when I think, right, having just given you the example of, am I really here just to get a free breakfast? What am I doing with my time? It's so early in the morning, right? When I think of it as a financial transaction, it simply isn't as appealing and it doesn't make as much sense as when I think about it as something that's part of my mandate as a professor and I get this opportunity to talk to you and I get to do all of these good things and talk about interesting stuff. That's really motivating and that's a value I actually hold. When I conceive of it in purely financial terms, I forget values that I myself hold and that's the danger of thinking financially. It can, if we let it be the only value that we care about, make us forget about the things that we ourselves value. And money's a fantastic tool, it's really good at achieving all kinds of important ends, but it has a limit. It isn't good at purchasing well-being indefinitely, it isn't good at getting us to conceive of our blood donation transactions in the right kind of way, and so the danger here is that we have to remember that money is a tool, right? Remember the old expression that when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail? Well, when you're only thinking in terms of money, everything looks like a financial transaction, but not everything is. We could succeed in corrupting ourselves by thinking of everything in sheerly financial terms and thinking that money solves every problem that we have, but that makes us forget values that we ourselves hold. And that's how I think corruption comes around. Now, you might well be thinking, okay, that's all very nice. You can't even afford proper dress pants. You're just a philosopher. Why should I listen to you? you you're a philosopher and you have to think about money in the abstract, right? You've never even had any contact with it. Well, <laughs> Happily, I have a good friend who used to work on Wall Street and has actually had contact with money and who I'm now going to bring up to the stage to speak to you now uh, about her experiences on Wall Street and elsewhere. So let me invite up Deborah Yedlin. So good morning, everyone. This is an intriguing topic for me. As kids, we are taught money can't buy happiness. As adolescents, we listen to all sorts of music that tell us otherwise. I remember listening to Pink Floyd, the song about money, grab that cash with, hand, with both hands and make a stash, new car, caviar, four-star daydream, think I'll buy me a football team. Or how about this one? In 1960, the Beatles released a song called Money, and it was re later re-recorded re by, um, by the Flying Lizards. The best things in life are free, but you can give them to the birds and the bees. I want money. That's what I want. That's what I want. And yet David has just spent 15 minutes telling us there's a limit to the amount of money we need to make us happy. Because after all, if you're an economist, you look at it from the perspective of a diminishing law of marginal returns. Now, I had a very interesting experience at the age of 19 where I actually had a lesson in the limits of money. I'd worked two jobs all summer, and I was going to pay for a year abroad studying French in Lausanne, Switzerland. But five days after I got to Switzerland, my appendix decided it was going to burst. And then I got peritonitis. I was in the hospital for almost two months. And it was the time of Ronald Reagan, David Stockman, and trickle-down economics. And the Getty Trust was being litigated. To this day, I remember reading about that in the International Herald Tribune, lying in my bed, hooked up to all sorts of drips, and thinking, I could have all that money, and I still couldn't get out of bed, much less have a chocolate bar, which is what I really wanted. <laughs> but
But not everybody believes there's a limit to money, as David alluded to. I call it the N plus one rule. Women have it with shoes. N is the optimal amount of shoes. <laughs> N plus one is what you really want for the shoes. Because it really hasn't stopped people trying to, uh, to get as much money as they can at any cost. And those who do that, I say, are engaging in something called a Faustian bargain. So I, you know, I remember the legend of Faust. He was a protagonist in a German legend, a bored scholar, David, if uh, you ever think that you need to change your life, who longs for a more interesting existence, and he makes a pact with the devil. His soul for an unlimited knowledge and worldly pleasures. And the deal Faust agrees to lasts for 24 years. It's a year for every hour in the day. And at the end of 24 years, the devil comes and claims Faust's soul. He's damned to hell for eternity. When I was thinking about examples of Faustian bargains, I came up with three ideas. Literature, finance, and sport. As an English major, I went right to, great, to Jay Gatsby, who grows up poor in North Dakota, falls in love with Rich Daisy, but she marries Tom Buchanan because her parents don't approve of Gatsby. And everything he does after the war is aimed to get Daisy back, and that means making as much money as possible, illegally, and being associated with people like Meyer Wolfsheim, a racketeer who's fixed the World Series, and of course we know Jay Gatsby ends up dead after a party. In Richler's The Apprenticeship of Duty Kravitz, Duty's grandfather tells him that a man without land is nobody. Acquiring land through youth, ruthless and ultimately dishonest means is what Duty does throughout the whole book. Now when I think about it, people think of, they cheat for prestige, money, or love. I started at Goldman Sachs at the tail end of the insider trading scandal in 1987. By then, there were a few people that had been charged with um, insider trading. You might recognize this guy, Ivan Boski. Dennis Levine, who was feeding Boski tips. And Michael Milliken, who was uh, head of Drexel Burnham and was, a, was uh, a big figure in the insider trading scandal. It was Boski and Milliken who got most of the attention. Boski was a Wall Street legend with an apparent uncanny ability to make calls on merger deals and make a gazillion dollars doing it. It turned out he wasn't smart or lucky. He cheated. Boski made no secret for his love of money. Even his father-in-law thought the only reason he married his daughter was because of the money she came with. He was charged in November of 1986, six months after giving the commencement address at the Berkeley School of Business ceremony. Here are the words of advice that he gave to the graduates. Greed is all right, by the way. I want you to know that. I think greed is healthy. You can still be greedy and feel good about yourself. Those words, of course, were immortalized in the movie Wall Street by Gordon Gecko. Greed, for the lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies and cuts to the essence of evolutionary spirit. At one time, Boski was worth $280 million. Now he lives in obscurity in California. Michael Milken has reinvented himself as a philanthropist, supporter of cancer research, and runs the Milken Institute, a nonpartisan economic think tank. Last December, Michael Milken was on the cover of Forbes in its special philanthropy issue with Malala Yousafzai. Does she even know what a junk bond is? Even though his foundation, which was established in 1982, before the insider trading scandal, and he's given away $500 million in the last 40 years, can his soul be redeemed, unlike Faust's? But investment bankers, and I, as, as a former one I say this, aren't the only ones in the pursuit of the almighty dollar at any cost. Athletes? For some reason, we have athletes on a sustainable pedestal. They are our modern-day warriors who win medals and championships, set records, and often compete complete unbelievable feats of physical fitness. One of my favorite examples is this guy. Lance Armstrong went from hero to pariah. Why did he cheat? Why do athletes cheat? 
for the money governments give them when they win medals, for sponsorships, for the money that the companies are willing to pay that will help their brand boost bottom lines, and of course, that ultimate goal of boosting shareholder value. It all works until someone pulls a Lance, a Tiger Woods, or you can fill in the blank. I bring up Lance Armstrong because he wanted, we wanted to believe in his seven Tour de France victories and that he was different because he had created the Livestrong Foundation. We have since discovered he's a very flawed human being and he remains a polarizing figure. On the one hand, he cheated, just like Milken. On the other hand, he established Livestrong. He also helped fund a chair in molecular cancer epidemiology at the University of Calgary. And I know that from being talking to the person who was involved with that chair, that if they met Lance Armstrong today, they'd have two words for him. Thank you. I know people today who still live, uh, who still wear the yellow Livestrong bracelet because they believe in what Armstrong did for cancer research and for cancer survivors. In Jewish law, the obligation to save a life is considered primary. And the Talmud says, saving, a lo saving one life is like saving the entire world. But now Lance Armstrong is trying to regain a measure of credibility. And that quest is going to take him to Calgary. And if anybody read the Herald today, there's an editorial about it. Towards the end of May, Lance Armstrong is coming to Calgary to raise money for the Calgary Jewish Community Center. It's no secret, this is a cycling mad town. People are going to buy tables and the event will sell out. The organization will make money to do the, be able to do the programs that it wants to do in the broader community, and Lance will allow the asking of a few questions. How he chooses to answer will be up to him. But it presents a very interesting ethical dilemma. You could call it the mutual commoditization for the purposes of fundraising and regaining legitimacy. If Gatsby, Milken, Boski, Armstrong embody the line from Scarface, don't underestimate the other guy's greed, Others will sell their soul in a different way. So driven to make as much money as possible, they forget about life itself. It's like what Camus said, a man wants to earn money in order to be happy, and his whole effort and the best of life are devoted to the earning of that money. Happiness is forgotten. The means are taken for the end. So why does this all happen? What makes people bend rules, break them, torture their bodies, forget about life. In fiction and in real life, there are characters who believe the rules don't apply. We call it hubris. Gatsby, Boski, Armstrong, Duty Kravitz, all sought wealth as a means to gain respect and legitimacy. They were all Faustian in the sense that they surrendered moral integrity to achieve power and success. And human nature being what it is, they weren't the first and they won't be the last. Thank you. Okay, this is the point um, where we open the session to questions, Q&A, but I always grab the airtime and ask my first couple of questions and then we'll turn it over to the floor. What we like to do is there will be a roving mic. So if you have a question for Deborah or David, uh, just put up your hand and somebody will come and give you the mic and then everybody in the room can hear the question. So my first question is for David and uh, Deborah. if you have seen some of this because you do have a joint degree here, um, please step in. But I, David, I want to know what is the difference between philosophy students and business students in relation to the discussions you have about money? Well, it's interesting. Uh, because I think a certain kind of stereotype is true here. Uh, that the, I run classes that have both philosophy students and business students in them, and they tend to view one another with suspicion. Uh, <laughs> because the philosophers think like, ah, you business guys are all sellouts, right? And the business students tend to think like, well, that's fine, you philosophers won't have a job in two years, so say whatever you want about me. Um, and I think, that they are, I think that the stereotypes about the way they perceive one another are pretty true when they meet one another, but I actually don't see much difference between the two when they are actually learning. 
uh, because both of them tend to be thoughtful and reflective, and I think they surprise one another uh, about how realistic the philosophy students can be and how really thoughtful and reflective the business students can be, contrary to the stereotypes uh, that they have about one another. I think the only real difference is that philosophy students are more comfortable with ambiguity on the way in than business students are. Um, although not with accountants. You would think that accountants would be the ones that need an answer at the end of it, but accountancy is actually the ancient medieval art of myriology, deciding how large the heap is and which things contribute to the heap or not. So accountancy students are actually incredibly philosophical. Okay, Deborah, <laughs> you have an MBA, you have a degree in English, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think what David's talking about is the, 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 really, the importance of David's class of having both students in the class is something, a lost art that we're not really dwelling on and really teaching our students as much of as we need to today, and that is the ability to intellectualize an argument and to really understand both sides, argue both sides, not necessarily believing either side, but really understanding the other perspective, because I think that makes for healthy discussion, and it actually makes for good policy and good strategy when you, come, when you look at it from a business standpoint. I think uh, we don't do enough of it, and it's really important that we have that cross-pollination. And certainly anybody who's read uh, Daniel Pink's book, A Whole New Mind, recognizes the importance that you just, to have sort of one discipline and not have the integration of creative processes within that step course of study, whether it's fine arts or philosophy or English, um, is actually means that organizations and individuals lose as a result of not having that uh, broader perspective brought to their education. One of the things that I had read in a research study is once they started to post the CEO salaries in the, in the annual reports, so this was supposed to make things more transparent and maybe make the pay a, a clearer picture and people could comment on that. It's back to the perverse comments that David talked about in the sense of all of a sudden it became a game. And what they saw was a huge increase in CEO salaries because they were now published and people always had to make more than the last person. So um, in particular, Deborah, have you seen much of this? Have you, do you think this is what's happening? It's become a game? As, Competing? Well, we hear it all the time. You know, if you're looking as a company looking to recruit somebody and you're trying to figure out what you have to pay them in order to come, what you have is a bevy of consultants who come and they do a whole comparison of all the uh, salaries of the people that you might want to hire and what they're making. And if you don't offer something along the same lines, that's, uh, you know, you're not going to get the candidate you're looking for. What concerns me, so that's, that's the private sector, but it's happening in the public sector. And I think that's even more challenging because you have these sunshine lists and everybody thinks that's really good because it's all about transparency and all of a sudden the net effect instead is going to be that you're going to have uh, the caliber of candidates that are going to be starting to come through are not going to be as high because you have this public pressure to bring down the salary because everybody thinks that what people are making in the public sector is too much already and so what kind of candidates are you going to attract into the public service whether it's elected officials or into the bureaucracy. Um, I think this works against society both at the high end in terms of um, uh, the corporate sector and it's going to work against the broader community as a result of the kind of pressure that will be brought to bear in terms of how people are, are considering the public sector as a viable option for them. So I, 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 both sides, not good. Any response, David? Well, I could just add to that that I think uh, we don't have good numbers because the populations are so small, but the, the one slide I uh, referred to, I think that what's going on there is it's really implausible to think that as CEO salary goes go up that their lives improve in terms of well-being, but if what, you're, if what does improve as your salary goes up in an almost linear way is how you conceive of what your score is, right. if, you're, if you're asking yourself, well, how am I doing? What score did I put up this year? It's so natural to just look at the one most relevant number to you, which is your salary. And I think part of what's going on there is that people, I mean, Donald Trump famously said, after a certain point, it's just keeping score. So I was thinking I had a solution to this, is not only would we post the CEO salaries, but based on De what Deborah's examples are, we should also post their contributions, their charitable contributions. So we can do a comparison. Here's your salary, here's your charitable contribution. <laughs> okay. All right, I'd like to open it up now to uh, the roving mics. If people have a question, there's one at the back. Okay. Well, thank you, David, and thank you, Deborah, for your insights. Um, I have a question I, for, to either one of you, and that's, how would you define greed? 
<laughs> well, I think it's an insatiable desire for something, and it could be anything. It's it could be money, it could be chocolate, it could be coffee, it could be scotch, it could be something that is you're willing to sacrifice, as I said, like Faust, whatever you believe to be your moral integrity to achieve that goal, whether it's realistic and relevant or not. It's become that to you, and you're willing to do whatever you need to do to get to that, to achieve that what it is. And I think once you get there, it's the N plus run rule. It's never enough, you have to find something else. I think I completely agree with that, but I, I think I would put two parameters on it. One would be that greed is a desire for wealth that's unnecessary, so it's a desire for more than you actually need uh, relative to what your needs are, or it could be desire for things that are damaging to one another. So in conditions of plenty, then taking more than you need seems greedy, but in conditions of scarcity, taking so much that nobody else can have any or so that other people are damaged in the process, that even if you're not quite, in, quite getting everything that you need, that could also look greedy, I think. Um, there's a mic over here. David, I'm wondering if you're familiar with Charles Eisenstein's Sacred Economics? No, please enlighten me. No. Um, so essentially he puts forward this argument that money kind of came about as a system to enable uh, more efficient transferring of gift. So looking at, as a, in smaller groups, it was easier to keep track of gifts informally, but then as you grow and things become more complex, you need some kind of mechanism to keep track of these complex transactions. Mm -hmm. So if we've gotten to a point now where our systems are so complex and maybe because we uh, work in such an efficient scale that we don't have that same type of human relationship or human connection that that gift kind of was at the center of, how can we as a society uh, move to a new understanding of money that maybe has some grounds in that traditional uh, kind of use but is maybe also in line with, with what we need to accomplish with money in the present uh, condition, with, within present conditions? Um, that's a great question. Thank you for telling me about him. I, I've heard that description, but I didn't know it by that name. Um, so the history of money is super interesting, and if we had 17 more hours, I could just keep telling you stories about it. Um, but I think that the origins of money are maybe less important right now than the situation we find ourselves in, because however we got here, it does look like there's all of this research to indicate that when we are thinking just in sheerly financial terms, even if the history of money was a kind of gift giving in the first place, we've lost that. And so the way to avoid the kind of pitfalls that I think we fall into is to just stop thinking in monetary terms sometimes. Or when we're considering a financial problem, take a moment, take a breath, and see what other kind of values are on the table that we do indeed care about and see how those things match up because money is at best an imperfect representation of other kinds of values that we hold, and just stopping and doing a psychological reframing I think is our best chance of doing that, and setting up systems and environments in which people are encouraged to do that is also really important. Just yesterday the World Bank released this report about development, about how important it is to permit people to think about things uh, using their available heuristics and their social norms, and insofar as we can change those, I think we could do better. Deborah, you yeah, wanna? I, I'd just like to remind everybody that we're sitting in a, you know, this is the Haskane School of Business. And money enables people to do other things for the community. And I would argue that it, that's part of, that's a piece that's not necessarily well entrenched in society today as, as it needs to be. Dick Haskane has set an incredible example for many people in this community, as have others. And it's this uh, spirit of generosity and understanding that with the get, with their, efforts, they can actually gift it back to the community and we all benefit as a result. The sad fact is every, there's still a very big cohort that still thinks the guy with the most toys wins and that's all they're thinking about and not re understanding that their responsibility to the community at large. Okay, I will take over here. Um, Matthew Arnold in um, turn of the century when he's talking about uh, uh, the, the growth of science and industry and the death of religion and he said in the stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse, uh, one uh, wandering between two worlds, one dead, the other powerless to be born. What do you think about modern day religion? Do you think they're more concerned now about market share and profitability rather than uh, uh, preserving the, the religious values of, of the past and having a moral compass? 
so um, I have a few thoughts on that. I think um, um, I've often thought about this in the context of, uh, in 1986, the insider trading scandals and some of the, tra the scandals since, whether it was Enron, WorldCom, you know, anybody else who we've, we've seen do the perp walk and someone, people who have egregiously defrauded uh, others. It occurs to me there's a, there's a couple of things going on. There's a, a crisis in faith that's taken, that's taken root in society as a whole, I'd say over the last 50 years. But we've become a very relative society. When you think about um, earlier times, and I, I often thought, why is it that in the th 40s, 50s, 60s, we didn't have corporate scandal the way we've had it in the 80s, 90s, and we will continue to have it. And part of that came back to this sense of absolutes. As young people growing up post-World War I, depression, post-World War II, Korean War, there were some very basic decisions that were made every day. How am I going to eat? How am I going to survive? And Dick Haskane told me a great story during the Depression. His dad ran a butcher's shop in Gleeson, Alberta. And every week, he would go to the auction and he would bet the family balance sheet to buy the cow that his dad was going to dress to sell in the butcher shop every week. And that was the kind of decision he had to make. It was survival. There was no gray area. It was black or it was white. You lived, you ate, you didn't, you didn't. You know, same thing during the war. And so those, that sense of absolutes that was also reinforced by going to church and going to Sunday school is gone from today's, I would argue, is gone from today's society. And so we live in this relative world. Well, so-and-so got away with it. They're kind of pushing the boundaries. Why is it that, you know, you know so it's OK? That sense of absolute's gone. And I think that sort of goes back to this, this value system in society that causes people to push boundaries to limits that, um, that we didn't see in the past. Um, so that's a few of my thoughts. I would just add one thing to that, that um, <clears throat> money has this way of commensurating values, that we think if you can give a financial value to everything, then you can compare them and make trade-offs among them. And in a way, that functions as an absolute when you're inside of it, right? So a great example of something somebody might not pay any money for is to give up their faith or give up their biggest, right, their, their deepest values. And if you found out that you could get your priest to give up his faith just at the right price, right? That if you say, oh, well, surely 5 million, 10 million? And then you get to 25, and it's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> then that seems to undermine that value, but it's perfectly rational if it's the right kind of financial transaction. Okay, we have a question over there. We'll yeah. come to you next. Um, so I, 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 thank you. That's incredible. And I'm thinking about a couple of things. I don't know if this relates to greed. I don't know if it relates to social legitimacy. But the question is around debt. And it, it's a story. I ran into someone the other day, and this is what she said. She said, I was walking down the street, and I encountered a homeless person. And he was asking for money, and I gave him a dollar, and he said, thank you, I'm broke, that has helped. And she said, as I continued down the street, I thought to myself, what makes me any different? Because I'm living on my line of credit. Am I broke, or is he broke? And so the debt thing, I just wondered if you could comment on that. Um, so debt's fascinating. <laughs> I just refereed, and here, here's 17 hours about debt. Uh, no, so um, debt is also a tool that we've invented just like money. There are some analyses of money that there's nothing to money other than a kind of indebtedness. Um, but think about, if you think about it like a tool, then you can think about what the difference might be, right? The relevant question here is not necessarily whether your net worth is positive or not. Mine is not. I went to philosophy graduate school, right? But here I am, you know, uh, in decent clothes, having a nice breakfast in a nice warm room. Um, and you could think about the difference with those two things about what kind of tools do we make available to people. One great criticism of debt is the way it can cause a kind of bondage or servitude for the people who take it in for themselves, but debt is also a means of class mobility. If your family can't afford to put you into school, but you can take out a loan and pay it back over that time, then that offers a tool to someone to improve their lives that they might not otherwise have. So I think, I don't necessarily think that money and debt are identical. But I think that understanding that they are both tools that we have invented and we grant to some people and not to other people is a way of explaining what's going on there. Okay. 
I just wanted to add, just your, your, your comment reminded me of uh, my father was in New York when I was living there and we went for a walk down the street and uh, this is 1988 and there were a lot of people, you know, there were people begging on the street. My dad started giving, every, you know, she'd beg and give money. I said, Dad, don't do that. You're going you're gonna to have no money in your pocket by the time we get to where we're going. And he said, but according to Jewish law, if somebody asks for money, you have to give it to them. Um, but I think, you know, just to talk about, just to add to David's point, it's, um, it's also a way it's a tool to, advance, to accumulate more wealth, right? You weigh the opportunity cost of, do I take out a loan for 2%? And if I can invest and make 4%, I've made, you know, so, I mean, that's, we've invented debt as a way of enhancing our, our wealth, as a vehicle to enhance, with which to advance our, enhance our wealth, whether it's by going to, being able to go to school and earn a job that pays you more money or to buy a stock that you otherwise couldn't find the cash to, to buy. The whole idea behind microfinance is about extending debt to people who otherwise couldn't right. access it. Yeah. So, so and it works, okay. right? Mm -hmm. well, Default rates on, on microfinance yeah. loans are very, very, very small. Um, Sorry, you are? <laughs> <laughs> Careful. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my question, on, and that was a great graph you had, David. On the low end, and always uh, when we're talking about the low end, it's the fear, the fear of starvation and the negative side. When we go up to the top end, somehow the framing turns around to number of toys and, and all on the upside. So here's my uh, question. Have you ever analyzed, either one of you, the problems we have in the top end, let's say like escalating salaries, from a fear or from a negative perspective? And let me frame it this way. I, I truly believe, because some of the hardest working people I know are making way more than they have to, and they know that. Uh, why do they do that? Because it is public, and because you don't want the embarrassment of uh, coming out there with a lower number than somebody who's, you know, it's actually even hard for the corporation, your CEO's making less than others, and that actually drives things up. How do we get out of that escalation? If that's true, if you at least look at it or consider, it's not just piling up the number of toys, but most uh, senior people I know who are very wealthy, one thing they can't afford is to be embarrassed and to be made to look bad. So how do we get out of that loop? That's a, a really good question. Um, I'm going to take it to a completely other end of the spectrum. What, it, what strikes me is, um, and this may be completely off track, but I'm going to try anyway. Public servants in the United States, ambassadors, dollar salary. And I think uh, we have this um, tendency in society, there's a price quality correlation. If you're not paying a lot of money for something, it's not worth anything, it's not that good. And if you're not paying a high salary for somebody, they're not that good. And we have been, we've become stuck in that, in that mentality Corporations have branded products. We buy into that brand and we pay ridiculous prices for those brands to buy those things. Some people do, some people don't. And the same thing has happened in the executive ranks, I would argue, uh, throughout corporations. And there is no sense that you can be very effective, very bright, and not, not, not have to be paid you know, the, the big bucks to do what you're doing. Uh, I, it's a societal value and it's a corporate uh, value. It's the way investors look at companies, everybody's bought into this ethos of if you're not being paid a lot of money, you, can't, you couldn't, you know, that price quality correlation, right or wrong. I, I love the word embarrassment that you used with this um, because embarrassment is socially constructed. Um, currently, it would be embarrassing for me to be wearing sweatpants and no shoes, um, but that's just a decision that we've made and maybe in another culture, right, in Silicon Valley, you can't wear a tie. That's a giveaway that you're not really serious but that's all just contextual, and it's within our power to decide what we honor and what we praise and what we shame. And if we just decided that the most honorable and impressive thing about you is not your salary, instead it's something else, then it wouldn't be embarrassing to take a hit in your salary if instead you were doing a thing that we cared about. If you stood up and said, no, I'm very proud of the pay cut I took, or I'm perfectly happy about that because look at what happened over here and there's this other important social value I have, then it wouldn't be embarrassing. And I don't know exactly how we make that transition, but it's within our power. It's not a fact that we just have to negotiate around. Well, the other thing I wanted to add too is, is how many people look at somebody and say, well, that person has a lot of money. 
they must be really smart. We ascribe a value to them that may or may not be true, and many times it's they're not as smart as you think they are. Um, <laughs> sorry, but it's 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 you know that guy's made a lot of money, that woman's made a lot of money, must be really really smart. That's a value that we, like I said, we we ascribe ascribe to them, which is not necessarily the case. Okay, so I'm going to respect the Haskane hour promise, but there somebody who's been waiting very patiently. He hasn't got a mic though, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, really interesting framing of the problem. So my, my interpretation is that we've lost connection between our personal values, value from a dollar, and value of a dollar. Uh, given we've had all this time and great com understanding of money, uh, are we any better off in trying to make better decisions than we were 20, 30, 2,000 years ago? And how do we get better? Can I talk about it in the context of the Alberta budget? <laughs> we haven't learned anything, because if you want to talk about it in the context of Alberta finances, we haven't learned a thing over the last 40 years in terms of how we think about money, how we think about it in terms of um, saving versus allocating expenditures. We arguably have just squandered a huge, huge gift of resource value, um, and next week we're going to find out how badly that squandering was. So. You're right, we've lost the value of a dollar and from a dollar, and there's nothing like adversity to teach that lesson for another generation, because we seem to have short memories um, about these kinds of cycles. I think we are getting better generally. Okay. <laughs> not, I'm cynical. Uh, I won't, <laughs> I'm American, I'm not going to get myself involved in, because you know, America's economy is totally fine. Um, <laughs> Can we talk about the that's, debt thing? <laughs> that's, um, but I, I actually think that one, you know, this is going to look self-serving maybe, but I think one thing that we can do is research and think more carefully about money because the science of money is really only about 250 years old in its, in its given form, right? If you think capitalism started really genuinely with Adam Smith in the 1750s, 60s or whatever, um, Deborah doesn't. I think that's a very plausible view. But started with the Romans. We've, well, so that's the very kind of question we need to look at, yeah. right? Because what kind of things are we describing that are, you know, ironclad economic laws? What kind of things are happening are sort of, you know, socially constructed social facts? What things can't we change and what things can we change? Um, and I think there's still lots and lots of research. There's lots we just simply don't know about that. And so, right, the, the study, the $75,000 study, that's only four or five years old. And that was real news, right? Prior to that, I think, I, I thought, oh, well, surely my life just gets better the more money I get. And it looks like we've discovered that, well, that's simply not true. So the more we can learn about this tool and the more we remember that it is a tool and what we want to use it for our values rather than it simply being our value, that's the thing that we sort of have to remember because it's so easy to think that we are that economic laws are just like natural laws and you couldn't change them any more than you could change the law of gravity. Maybe that's true in some cases, maybe it isn't. Knowing the difference is gonna be fantastically useful for us. And it, it requires a very, very hard examination of societal values. Thank you. Thanks.